All right, guys, we are live for episode four of Fredrickson Health Solutions. Today, we have a very special guest, Dr. Victor Karsud. Am I saying that right? <laughs> Karsrud, it's okay. Karsrud, Karsrud. It's, it's Norwegian. It's not supposed to be intelligible. You know? <laughs> we used to, used to use our last names as bludgeoning weapons. It's all right. Yeah. Well, well, today we're going to talk a lot about immune health, and I wanted to bring Dr. Victor. I'm just going to say Dr. Victor because your last name is too hard for me to pronounce. It's okay. No worries. But, but uh, Dr. Victor, go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell everyone about your backgrounds. And I heard you just recently got your MD degree. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my, my academic background is a little bit like a train wreck. Um, I started out life as a gene therapist. Um, I did research at UTMB in Galveston. Um, so I have a, uh, a master's degree in biochemistry and genetics, specializing in gene targeting from UTMB. Um, moved from there into natural medicine, got my DC from Texas Chiropractic College, uh, shortly after became board certified in internal medicine and family practice, board certified in clinical nutrition, um, and I sit on the national board for pharmacology and toxicology for the ACA. Um, because apparently, as my wife puts it, I didn't have enough letters after my name, um, I went back and got uh, an MD uh, in one of the only bridge programs that was out there for DCs. So I have an MD and a PhD uh, specializing in uh, nutritional endocrinology. So I've gotten, uh, and after that, my wife cut me off. She says no more letters for a while because um, I'm running out of room on the door, which is fine. So, um, but basically that the, the upshot of all that is not to brag, but is to say that, look, everybody, all of us come from a wide variety of standpoints. I mean, whether you're and I got an exercise physiologist background and then became a dentist, okay, that gives you a unique perspective to your patients. Um, and certainly as a, as a patient that, you know, your background is unique. So you need to bring everything that you are to the table on that. I mean, your health isn't just a matter of making sure you're taking the right medications, um, but you have to bring every aspect of your background and what you know of your, of your interactions with other people, your past uh, uh, experiences, everything to the table to try to bring yourself to the maximum level of health that you can. And if you're a practitioner, make sure that you're incorporating everything from your background, even if you have a background in plant biology, right? it gives you a unique perspective and make sure your patients get that reflection because I don't believe that medicine should be a one size fit all. We should have that individual right to be able to practice as an art of healing, not just the standardized um, formula because when that happens and, you know, and as much as I, I've been following the, the progression of um, artificial intelligence, I listened at A4M about two years ago to the, um, the head of Watson's division for biomedical sciences talk about how they are using AI to improve diagnosis and to do more background information and um, develop new drugs and so on and so forth. And I'm like, and those, it was at the same time very encouraging because I had a, a I had a pharmacist next to me who was going like, doesn't that scare you? You know, I've read science fiction books that start like this. And I looked over at him and said, really, do you think AI could do any worse? So I, I, I'm a little worried, though, that AI, if it starts to become like the dominant force, is just going to reinforce what we're seeing already, and that is medicine has no art left to it. There's no variability. There's no accommodating things that don't quite fit, you know, the established parameters, and that's where both as patients and as doctors, it's important that we keep that art of healing around because there does need to be that human element to all of this that unfortunately is being lost as time goes along. So, Right. Yeah. Then we have the restrictions that stay at home, you know, it orders. So a lot more are seeing the doctors through telehealth. And You mean like this? <laughs> like this, like this right now. Right. And so we're doing it. We only live, you know, 20, 30 minutes away from each other. So. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, today I just want to, I want to talk about immune health with you and you're one of the smartest docs I know. Aww. And yeah. And I, I want to get into the science a little bit. I want to, you know, I want to talk about immune cells. I want to talk about neutrophils, macrophages, what happens when a healthy immune system, you know, contacts a virus and what a unhealthy mm -hmm. immune system happens when they contact a virus. Can you kind of go through some of that with us? Oh, okay. So you're asking me to condense like four years of medical school immunology down to like five sentences. Um, <laughs> Right. Okay. So realize that, I mean, your immune systems, first of all, got two major divisions, the innate and adaptive immune systems. Um, and those include things like intact mucosal barriers. And that sounds very kind of uh, rudimentary, but I mean, for a functional medicine practitioner, it's actually very important because um, if you've got leaky gut, if you've got, you know, I mean, this is the same reason they talk about like washing your hands. Don't disagree with that. Bluntly, that's a little remedial. If you have to be reminded to wash your hands, we really have problems. But um, but nobody thinks about if you've been encouraging that, what about all these people with leaky gut? That 
that intact barrier in your gut is one of the is one of the first defenses you have against stuff coming across. And there has been a lot of evidence, a lot of talk about possible um, uh, oral uh, or oral contamination with COVID as well. Um, so making sure that you have intact gut health. I mean, it sounds very rud you know rudimentary, but you know if you don't have you know, and this is where things like L-glutamine come in, or uh, IgG extracts, or colostrum, probiotics. I mean you know, all the way down to aloe vera. There's tons of ways to do this. But if you don't have an intact gut lining, that innate immune system, that intrinsic barrier is going to be essentially gone by itself. Um, and then you have all the adaptive immune system. And I mean, and that ranges all the way from complement on one end, which is this really kind of, and I love complement. Complement is, is these kind of vague little proteins like C3A and C3B and C5 and so on and so forth that you know, I'll be honest, not even doctors really seem to understand very well. It's this, you know, it's these rudimentary proteins that kind of attack anything that's not normal in the system um, up through both a cellular mediated and an antibody really uh, mediated response. And those, cell, those cells, and basically those are T cells and B cells respectively. And you also have a bunch in there like natural killer cells and macrophages and so on and so forth. And those all boil down to things that eat other cells and other things. Um, but in terms of uh, in terms of your, so you've got the various classes of white blood cells like neutrophils. And neutrophils are um, predominantly against bacteria. And then you've got the big one that we're dealing with, with COVID, which is all your B cells. And that's where the, that's where you have B and T cells kind of branching off of each other as those, are those lymphocytes. Um, one group are involved with recognizing cells that need to be destroyed, uh, recognizing um, the antibodies and so on and so forth, and the other one are actually producing those antibodies. So you got like Th1 cells, T, hel T helper cells, for example, on one side, and those are largely involved, for example, with your Im your your immune response and inflammation toward uh, toward insults. Um, on the other side, you have your B cells, like you know the ones that produce your your antibodies. Um, and the balance between those, and they have various fancy names like CD4 and CD8 and so on and so forth, and all those have to do with how they stain for the various tests that the doctors look for. Um, the immune system, and this gets very, very complicated because I'm kind of seeing, you know, even with, you know, Robert, I mean, you're, you're a doc yourself, you've got a lot of background. And even then we got this kind of, you know, deer in the headlights look going on. Right. I got news for you. That's why they have immunologists because this is an incredibly complicated process. Um, from our standpoint, it's all about maintaining balance, okay? Um, we know that if you get an imbalance, you either have immunosuppression on one side or autoimmune disease on the other. Um, and it's important to try to maintain, from a natural standpoint, that balancing act between the two systems. Um, the good news is, is that natural approaches are all about trying to maintain that, that sense of balance. Um, for example, uh, colostrum, PRP sprays, um, uh, there's a, a agaricus blazii. There are a couple of medicin medicinal mushrooms, for example, um, that are all about trying to maintain the balance between, for example, the various aspects of your T cells, Th1 to Th2. Okay, push to, push one too hard, you get too many allergies. You push the other one too hard, you get autoimmune disease. It's the idea about maintaining that balance between them. And most natural products, unlike pharmaceuticals, do a fairly good job of trying to steer that body back to the center, so you're not having it too far one way or the other. Um, so like I said, agaricus blazii, some of the medicinal mushrooms, colostrum, all those things are designed to try to rebalance that, not improve it, not depress it, but balance it. Um, vitamin D, and you and I have had lots of discussions about vitamin D. Um, vitamin D is based on the same structure that your body builds, uh, builds cholesterol off of. Um, that same structure is what it builds estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, cortisol, a lot of your steroid hormones off of as well. Well, that vitamin D has a hormonal signal. And for the immune system, for those people that are using vitamin D, um, it's about using that vitamin D as a maturation signal to all of the forms of your, of your white blood cells to try to get them mature faster to a more active state. Um, so essentially that's what it is. It's kind of like, you know, fostering along both your T cells and your B cells and your natural killer cells and everything else. And that's why vitamin D is shown to be so effective as an antiviral agent. Um, now, of course, I would never turn around and say do it independently. You always want to do these things in combination, but that's why you have studies out there that are showing, you know, as opposed to the five or 10,000 I use that a conventional MD may look at, um, on the naturopathic side, on the functional medicine side, we may talk about temporary stress temporary doses of vitamin D up to like 50,000 IUs or more a day. 
Um, there are studies, for example, and if you're worried about, oh my God, that's toxic. No, I'm not talking about long term. I'm talking about short term. Toxicity usually hits in the, when the blood values pass about 200 to 250. Um, but the 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 actual negative effects that you get for for vitamin D, I've only seen it once, and that was first who was taking 50,000 IU's for six months. Um, and their blood levels were passing 250 at that point. You come off for, you know, two or three days and everything resolved like that. It was great. Um, but there are studies out there. If you're worried about a single dose being toxic, there are studies showing between 650 and 700,000 IUs in a single dose actually have been shown to reverse hyperparathyroidism. And those papers are readily available on PubMed. Okay. Now we're not talking about doing that every day, but it should let you know that this is not a toxic element. It's right. only toxic when you increase it over time. Um, Dr. Tulp, one of my professors in med school, for example, um, that we used to say that the difference between a poison and a, and a medicine is in the dosage. Okay, so how much you're doing and for how long largely determines whether or not it's going to be problematic. Um, but anyway, so the, the, the good news is, as we start to explore these various aspects, um, the things in natural medicine that we use to try to improve your immune status, we really don't worry about trying to, we're really not pushing those things one way or the other. It's all about increasing the adaptability of the immune system. Um, zinc. Zinc works largely by trying to make sure that, I mean, there's, there's regions in proteins called zinc finger domains that literally look like little fingers, okay? And your body sticks zinc in the middle of them so it can make a quaternary structure. It can make a little hand or whatever you need to, to you know, attack the, you know, either rip stuff apart or to, you know, activate an enzyme or so on and so forth. That's part of how zinc works. Of course, it also works by being directly intracellularly toxic to some infected cells. So, um, but again, there, no, trust me, I've never seen anybody with a zinc toxicity. I mean, I suppose if you decided to like eat a battery, maybe you could get there, but I don't think it's a large possibility. Um, you know, in standardized dosages of 50 milligrams or so are quite effective. Um, and ironically enough, one of the few things, one of the things we're finding out about this particular crisis is, gee, these medications work well, but they only do so if your body has the right natural things to go along with them to work. I mean, we had all that all that controversy about hydroxychloroquine. And no, it didn't work in those studies. Why? Because they removed the natural element that works synergistically with it. Um, vitamins, vitamin D, vitamin C, um, zinc, so on and so forth. Um, and it's not, and I've had a lot of patients go, oh my God, I got to take all this stuff. And I have to take all this stuff. Again, because the immune system is adaptive, um, it's a matter of looking at what your strengths and what your weaknesses are. If you're you know, you're a hardcore, 100% organic vegan that's, you know, pounding down a ton of, you know, good solid vegetables and fruits every day, and you've got enough vitamin C to, you know, stave off, you know, stave off the oxidative powers of the entire tobacco industry, great, okay, maybe your problem is you're not getting out in the sun because you're spending too much time eating vegetables, so... <laughs> Unless you're gardening, yeah. unless you're yeah. gardening the vegetables. Maybe we got to work on your vitamin D. Maybe, you know, if, if complement is a problem, for example, all these proteins are made in your liver. If you've got liver problems, we need to come along and look at your liver. Um, this is not a one-stop shop. I mean, it's finding out where where the gaps in your immune system may be. Are you more pro-inflammatory? Do you have difficulties adapting? Do you have, um, you know, do we need, uh, do you have an autoimmune condition? Um, that may be distracting your immune system. Uh, do you have a pre-existing viral, uh, viral load? Have, your, have you got chronic Epstein-Barr? God forbid you've got one of those people that are fighting chronic candida. Do we need to knock those out so your immune system has the adaptability to go and fight it? Um, and kind of backing that up because I got rolled over it. And boy, you are really letting me just kind of hang myself, aren't you, Robert? No, 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 I um, love it. I love it. I will also say that one of the things, because this is all about adaptability, um, but adaptability in the immune system is all about the, the body's ability to step back from a crisis and say, okay, now it's time for me to address the next one. Well, unfortunately, the signal that our body has that tells us we need to be stuck in one form or another is largely inflammation. You know, and again, for any naturopath or functional medicine practitioner out there, this is, this is no, nothing new. So if I'm inflamed, if I've got a toxicity, that chronic inflammation promotes all of these uh, cytokines that promotes, which are basically a fancy term for the chemicals that the body produces, to your immune system that tells them we need to upregulate all of these differentiated cell types. And, you know, cytokines, you know, 1 through 12 and so on and so forth, and they each got various, various uh, stimuli and responses. But 
what it all boils down to is if, if we can reduce that level of inflammation, all of a sudden we remove the burden and the signal to the immune system. So now the immune system can use that vitamin C, can use that zinc, can use that vitamin D uh, to turn around and have more of an adaptive response toward whatever rolls across the, across the table at us. Nice. Man, so we went, we went deep. I'm going to backtrack a little bit. <laughs> so I'm going to backtrack on three things. And first thing, so we talked about zinc, we talked about vitamin D, and we also talked about yep. T1 and TH2. So first to the yep. zinc. Have you been reading any of the research talking about zinc being a positive ion? Therefore, you need a zinc ion phoretic to help increase zinc intracellularly. So for instance, a lot of research has been looking at quercetin because it's a natural zinc ion phoretic. Have you seen any of those studies? Um, I have, I've, I've not read them, but I've, I've kind of caught it in passing. I mean, it's like everybody else to get a ton of data. Um, no, and that's, that's part of the reason that I think quercetin may be working the way that it does is actually increasing the, uh, that's why we think, for example, it may be so useful in, in heart muscle because it actually helps balance out a lot of those ions. So that doesn't surprise me terribly much. Now, I, again, I think that quercetin, quercetin is a good place to start, but like everything else, it's a matter of, what do your intrinsic levels look like? And, and you know me, I'm all about, you know, testing. So, you know, even if it, whether it's, you know, the simple zinc tally test, which only everybody fails, um, or one of the more advanced serum tests, it may not be a bad idea to get those levels checked. Um, some people may not need the, the, the quercetin to bring it up, but, um, you know, to bring it into the cell. But if you've got, if you've got issues already that imply it, I mean, we, I mean, we use quercetin if you've got congestive heart failure, we use quercetin if you've got, um, uh, problems with your, your allergies because it thins out mucus. And let me tell you, because I'm from Austin, um, for those of you that may be out of state, we are the allergen capital of the world. There is always some little thing blooming that is making the noses stop up here and quercetin will dry you up faster than, you know, faster than reading a stereo manual. I mean, it is dry city. Uh, <laughs> I like quercetin and it does well. It doesn't surprise me that works synergistically. Um, and that, that brings a good point. Um, the, a lot of times we have difficulties with natural substances, even with pharmaceuticals, because the delivery mechanism is impeded by absorption. It's like I was talking about earlier with the gut. If you've got an inflamed gut, no matter how great your, you know, your, your nutrients may be, you're not going to pull them across because the gut's not capable of doing it. But we've got the gut lining, we've got transport in the blood, we've got the cellular membranes, there are all these barriers trying to get the, the stuff from where it is to where it needs to be to work. So, you know, quercetin, like mycelizing something, like liposomal encapsulating it, like um, uh, turmeric, one of the things we're finding out, and you and I have had this conversation, um, part of the problem was absorption, but right. that's when you had like standardize it down to this one component that's got a high amount of just that, uh, just that curcumin. But when you actually get like a full natural form of it, so it's actually got all the subcomponents, all of a sudden the absorption gets better. So um, it's a, one of my favorite movies, a Real Genius, you used to have this great line in there. It's like, do you think it's design error or a launch error? And my, you know, my running joke is, what do you mean a launch error? It's all about design errors, right? You didn't design it right. Well, no, the design may be okay, but it's all about the delivery. It's all about, well, it's about like my bad jokes, right? It's all about the delivery. Um, if you don't have the full form, if you don't combine it with the, the quercetin, if you don't have the liposomal uh, or the mycelized subfraction, maybe you're not absorbing that stuff. In which case, you know, you're, you may do a great job of, you know, pulling in 100 milligrams of zinc a day, but if it's a zinc oxide, yeah, you're not going to pull it in very well. It's got, it's got to have a delivery mechanism in there somehow. Into the cell. Into the cell. Yeah. So that's why a lot of no, people I, will use like a chelated form, like a zinc glycinate, right, to help get the zinc from my understanding out of the extracellular space and then into the intracellular space yeah so that's like a lot of these so i always talk to, to doctors every day and some you know some are more conventional and they tell me hey supplements don't work i'm like look doc 20 years ago if you're using a calcium carbonate or a zinc oxide or a magnesium oxide yeah those probably didn't work because the absorption was super low but technology research yeah. especially in the supplements is growing in evolving and it's if you yeah. weren't into supplements now i can guarantee if we did a blood test on some of these doctors that the labs would show us severe nutrient deficiencies so well and and even with even without doing the nutrients because conventional allopathic mds don't run a lot of i mean they, even if you look at uh, at nutritional uh, nutritional values they just they're not familiar with that blood work but they're familiar with a lot of the conventional blood work and the, the thing is you can take standardized like um Let's say let's use uh, 
fish oil. Okay. Um, you know, a nice natural non-esterified, you know, or, or, or natural triglyceride form of fish oil. Um, you can run CRP, you can run ESR, you can run um, ANA, you can run a lot of the inflammatory markers, for example, um, and dose them with fish oil. And there are plenty of studies out there that actually show their effectiveness. Um, and uh, the doctors that claim that there's no studies that do that, it's like, I invite them. It's like, go ahead, prove me wrong, because let's go over to PubMed, which is, you know, the grand repository of all medical knowledge. And it's open to the public. Fine, go in and type in like, you know, fish oil. And, you know, and of course, you're going to get papers on both sides. But it's not like there's no data out there at all. And depending upon how you, how careful you are about looking at that data, you can find that there's plenty of out data out there that supports it. You're right, Robert. I mean, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, there wasn't a lot of published studies out there in, you know, good journals and refereed journals. But there's no excuse in saying there's no data out there now because there's tons of it if you bother to go out and look. Um, that's also why it's important. And I'm not, gonna, I'm, not, I'm not trying to plug you, but, I mean, but that's also why it's important to be careful what supplement companies you're working with um, because it's all about the science behind the supplements, to borrow a friend of mine's phrase. Um, you've got to make sure that you have not only supplements that have been manufactured well and have a good efficacy, but that you can prove that have had proven uh, studies that show, based on this, I'm having this effect and I can show that I can show that on a, on a clinical level that I'm having the effects that I'm looking for. Because, you know, you can take all the, all the pills you want in the world. You have to be able to prove that they're actually working. So, exactly. yeah. Love it. And then, um, I, I don't know if you follow, follow Dr. Bredesen. He talks a lot about copper pipes. We know that copper and zinc kind of have an inverse relationship. If you have a lot yep. of fittings, you might have a zinc deficiency. And for a lot of people listening, I'm, what do you think the population is that people are zinc deficient? And oh, uh, easy. Get easy. At every day to, to help that. Okay. Well, and, I, and, and the, my answer to that is the answer is like 80%. And the reason I say 80% because, um, so let's go back to what we know zinc does. Um, and you're right. Copper does compete with zinc in a lot of respects. And that balance is very important. In fact, if that balance gets too far out of whack, that's one from a functional medicine standpoint, that's one of the indicators for cancer is mm -hmm. when you have an imbalanced ratio between those. Um, copper deficiency, on the other hand, if you push too far the other way, because it's important that balance maintains, you get too far out of copper deficiency, all of a sudden you can start driving, driving them forward into hypertension. Weird. Um, yeah, go figure. It's always those weird little things that we all find out. Um, but so let's go back to what zinc does in the body. It, it forms those little zinc finger domains. One of the proteins that it forms is that it helps form is gustin, which is in your mouth, right? And gustin is one of those proteins that helps you taste heavy metals. So it literally looks like a little hand and you get your zinc over here and it kind of glob gloms onto it and carries it over to, um, to your taste buds. Well, if you are zinc deficient, because it's like having a finger with all, you know, a hand with all the fingers unraveled. Um, if you've got somebody who is zinc deficient, what will happen is the gustin will absorb the zinc. Um, it'll work on refolding the zinc finger domains in the gustin itself, and there won't be any zinc left over to be transported over to the receptor. So one of the tricks, and I say tricks because this is like, you know, all naturopaths have like our, our um, you know, our, our, our party favors, right? We have like our party tricks. Do this and see, ooh, that's amazing stuff. Um, one, of the, one, of the, one of them is the zinc, zinc tally test, right? Um, the zinc tally test where you, you take a, you take aqueous zinc and you, you know, you swish around in your mouth and, and does it taste like water? Um, or if it tastes metallic, how long does it take for it to start taking metallic? And basically if you can taste it, you've got enough. If it tastes like water and takes a long time for you to start tasting it, it means you're deficient in zinc. Mm. Well, yeah, I did this for years. I gave up doing it. Why? Because everybody fails. Nobody passes that test. You know, there's the odd, like, hardcore vegan taking 20 supplements a day that actually does have enough. But the vast majority of people, I mean, easily 70, 75% or more, all failed that test. That's why I call it a naturopathic party trick, because it's like, boop, you know, say you need it. Um, it's kind of like iodine tally testing, which everybody likes too, which is like, you know, you take, you take a, take a two by two area of, of iodine and paint it on your forearm and see how long it takes it to disappear. Um, any doc that's ever worked, you know, an ER will tell you if you put paint betadine on a patient um, for a minor surgical procedure, you paint it on, you know, and stitch something up and half an hour later, you pull back the sterile field and, you know, it's gone. Look, Behold, there's no man behind the curtain, right? It's a, it's a party trick. Why? Because when you're deficient in iodine, the body will actively transport and pull that iodine across and make it disappear. Iodine in a person that's, that's been 
uh, that's been supplementing that has adequate levels of iodine, that, you know, that iodine patch will last for 18 to 24 hours. But in most people, it's like gone within two to three hours. I mean, it's so, you know, again, the number of people that fail these are huge. Why? Because, and Robert, again, you and I have had this conversation. We are the most overfed and undernutriented population on earth. We eat a lot of food, but it's incredibly nutri nutritionally depleted. I mean, that's part of the reason people eat so damn much is we get that drive to eat because we don't get enough food that actually feeds us. You know, right. you notice you actually, you, I, I, and I had this conversation with a friend of mine. I said, you go to one of these like organic restaurants and you know, everything is organically grown. It's like, and they serve you these portions that are like, you know, this big. And you're like, how can you possibly be full on that? I'm like, because that's what you need if you're actually getting nutrients out of it. You don't need a burger this big, right? You need, you just need enough to get you the nutrients that's coming in. Unless you're my eight-year-old son, in which case you need like half a cow because he's he's like an eight-year-old boy. So, right? No, I know exactly what you mean. Going to those uh, restaurants like that, small yeah. portions for eighty dollars, right? <laughs> you know, but you know, the eighty dollars I'm not going to argue for. It's like, eh. um, but no, but I mean, the reason you don't need those giant portions is you actually feel okay because you're not getting the extra inf well and you're also not getting the inflammatory aspects of it right um you know i'll pay an extra couple of bucks to make sure i'm not getting growth hormones or extra estrogens or you know anything else coming in through you know the meat that i decide to eat i mean it's there's our our there is a reason we lead the world in cancers there's a reason we lead the world in autoimmune disease there's a reason we have you know the diabetes is the second most common diagnosis in america i mean there's it, our, what has happened to the American food system is ludicrous. Um, and I, I mean, I've often said that, and I, I mean, and you talk about the, this is supposed to be about the immune system, but I mean, realistically, this is all feeding into it. The Greeks, the Egyptians, uh, the, the Indians, the Chinese, food is medicine, right? Okay. The old adage, okay? So it's like, you want to strengthen your immune system, go back to the diet. Um, what do you eat? Well, first of all, you stop the standard American crap. I mean, we got we to knock that out. Right. I often said that the, the worst thing we ever did to, you know, a foreign nation was not dropping an atomic bomb on them, but was exporting like McDonald's and Burger King and KFC. Um, there, are, there are restaurants, you can go to malls in uh, the UAE, and they have large pizzas with a cheeseburger cooked into every, the end of every slice. I'm not kidding. There's a reason that, you know, that they lead us and actually lead us in diabetes. That's hard to do but they actually beat us on a, on, a, on a per capita basis. We exported the standard American diet. I have a patient who's a cardiovascular patient. He lives in, in Mumbai in India. And, um, and I got to tell you, his, uh, admittedly, he's, he's, he's well off, so he's getting the best doctors over there, but I'm really impressed with the effect they do because they balance out the natural and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the pharmaceutical versions. And one of the things that I said about him was, because we were working on, you know, why did you get into this situation? Why do you have this plaque and what's going on? We had a conversation. It's like, and the problem is, is because he moved in the middle of Mumbai. He started, he's, he's in industry. He's, you know, hard guy. He's driven forward. Uh, starts describing what he's doing every day. And basically he's eating the same way that every American does. Okay. And I said, well, start describing to me what you were doing when you were growing up. Cause he grew up in this little village, you know, out in the middle, out in the middle of nowhere. And he talks about how his grandmother would make things and how, you know, the, the vegetable based diet and everything else. And I'm like, your problem is you started eating like an American. Okay. If you went back and ate a lot of the native foods, you started eating, you know, cleaner, you started eating more organic, you did less processed stuff. And sure enough, we got him exercising, we got him eating cleaner, and all of a sudden everything clears up. Okay. It's not, it doesn't take pharmaceuticals. It takes reducing that. And right now, even with all of this going on, I'm not worried about him because if you are having a good clean diet, if you're having enough vegetables, I mean, God forbid we talk about vegetables, um, that bring in those antioxidants, you're bringing enough uh, you're getting out and getting the sunlight to generate your vitamin D. As long as you're, if your diet is doing well, you're not going to need a lot of those supplements in the first place. Your immune system is designed, um, and, and that's why these stay-at-home orders are driving me crazy. They lock everybody inside. I'm like, you know what? If I had my druthers, I'd, I'd require, forget stay-at-home, I'd require everybody to go to you know, like one of the state parks for, yeah, you want fun? Great. Let's all go to a state park, you know, take a trash bag, clean it up for, you know, for an hour, get out there, take your shirts off, let's get some vitamin D going. Because staying inside, cowering in fear, not getting our vitamin D is doing way worse for our immune system than getting up and getting exposed, my personal opinion. I agree. Don't quote me on it. No, I agree. Um, but yeah, it's got, it's got to start with diet, okay? You got to get, you got to get the inflammatory stuff out. Now, um, again, if you've got a food allergy, half of the American population is gluten sensitive. 
I'm not saying the gluten is the root of all evil, but you know, it's definitely a leaf or maybe a runner. I mean, because it's just <laughs> gluten is not healthy for the vast majority of people. It's certainly just a simple carbohydrate, if nothing else. Reducing your carbs, figuring out if you're gluten sensitive, um, eating more veg more vegetables and more fruits. Um, you know, and then we get into the argument about, you know, ketogenic or paleo or whatever else. And that 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 varies considerably depending upon, you know, what the practitioner wants. Um, I don't think that keto works for everybody, but it certainly is a great re reset. There's been a number of studies um, on its on its anti-inflammatory capabilities. Um, paleo, you know, the whole idea of, God forbid, you know, eat unprocessed, native, you know, raw wherever possible. Right? And there's, it, it's hard to argue the logic of eating more vegetables and cleaner, cleaner, cleaner foods. Um, the fun one that becomes more accessible to everybody, because invariably there's going to be somebody watching this going, well, that's nice, but I live, you know, in the middle of, of Houston and there's not an organic restaurant to be found for 50 miles, which is, which is not true because I actually know one over near the Galleria. But anyway, so, <laughs> but the, the one thing that they have found, because let's go back to the whole inflammation thing, uh, is intermittent fasting. Now, you know, you and I have talked about uh, A4M, the American Association of Anti-Aging Medicine. Um, and you kind of watch the trends in functional and natural medicine to kind of walk through there, because that's the Super Bowl for, for functional medicine. Um, and the big thing in the last couple of years has been intermittent fasting. Um, that intermittent fasting where you're either narrowing your your window of eating down to about eight hours a day, or you're doing a 48 hour water fast every month or something, that process um, seems to evoke. And you gotta get past about 48 hours if you're actually doing a fast. Once you get past about 48 hours, it actually induces um, that, that cellular state, what we call autophagy, where the body says, okay, we're, we're serious about this. And so it starts chewing up all the pro-inflammatory debris and kind of house cleaning and so on and so forth. Um, where those, it activates growth hormones, it, it decreases inflammatory levels, um, it upregulates your metabolic status, so you're actually burning fats more efficiently. Uh, and there's all these positive benefits. And again, this goes back to, this sounds, this sounds really complicated, but gee, how, 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 how long has man been fasting as a matter of, of cleansing? I mean, you go back, you read in the Bible about when really bad stuff happens and they have to get rid of this uber bad. What do you do? Prayer and fasting. Okay. So, oh, and fast, fasting seems to be the one nobody wants to remember. It's like, yeah, I'll do prayer, but man, don't take away my cheeseburger. Right. Um, you've got to get that fasting element in because as we find out now, as medicine catches up with our historical precedents, our historical precedents is that you do fasting in these times because it helps purify the body and get you, get you ready for things. Well, now we're finding out it's because it promotes autophagy, decreases, uh, decreases your insulin, which suppresses your immune system, okay, and promotes, and promotes healing in the body. Now, I'm not saying stop eating entirely, but, you know, that intermittent fasting, um, whether it's the time restricted by, by period of day or doing a periodic fast every month, again, you have, generally have to get past that 48-hour period before it really starts kicking in. But, you know, sometimes, because you started out with what do you eat in order to boost your immune system, sometimes it's as much of what you're not eating as what you are. That's a good point. That's a very good point. And um, I just think, I don't know, when I was growing up as an athlete, it was like eat six meals a day, six to eight, you know, every two hours I had a protein bar, I had a snack and I kept, you know, just feeding, feeding, feeding. Yeah. And I'm sure my blood sugar spikes and insulin, you know, were through the roof. And it's funny that you talk about this because I'm actually wearing a, <laughs> wearing a CBM. Can you see it right there? Oh, there we go. And so, is, that where, is that where they put the spigot in? We just tap the keg? No. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But what's been interesting for me, Doc, is, so I drink, or I did drink the Zevia sodas, right? That's like the only uh, thing. My little sweet treat that I thought was healthy because it was naturally sweetened with stevia, but that was skyrocketing my blood sugar. You know, it was going yeah. from 85 to about 125. And so when I took that out three days ago, I didn't need the snacks. I could have my functional food at 10 a.m., my lunch, my last meal, dinner around six or seven, and I was satiated. I was full. Yeah. And I'm losing weight, you know, because I'm not having these big, you know, increases and therefore decreases in blood sugar all throughout the day. And I think we should have, you know, specific. And, you know, I got a, I got a, I got a, I got a perfect response for you there. What you need to do, friend, is you need to go back to medical school because there's nothing like long nights and high stress to really make you try to back on the pounds. <laughs> right. Right. But uh, I, I think fasting, everyone's talking about it. A lot of people think they're fasting, but they have yeah. maybe like a, latte from starbucks we're like well no that's that's oh yeah it's only it's only a thousand calories it's not really it's not really food 
Right. So I, I, you know, I know exactly what you mean. And just yeah. maybe we'll get to a point where, yeah, we need to have meal times and we need to have breaks from those meals. We need to have times where we rest and digest and also times where we feed. And so I think we're getting yeah. a lot more clarity. There's a lot of people out there that talk about this all the time. But um, one more thing, going back to zinc. <laughs> um, so the zinc tally test, I'm sure we're going to get some questions on that. Um, yeah. People do that at home and how much zinc, does it have to be zinc oxide because they use a zinc chelate? Does it matter on the form? Um, you know what? I don't remember what they use. It's been so many years. I think it was a zinc oxide that they were using in an aqueous solution. But there are three or four manufacturers that make, you know, a standardized aqueous zinc. And basically, you're just taking a little... You know, you're, you're taking, you know, 10 or 10 or 15 mLs and squishing it around your mouth. And if you've got sufficient amounts of zinc, you should be able to taste it almost instantly. Okay. If it takes you more than about, if it takes you more than about 15 or 20 seconds to start tasting a metallic taste, you know, that kind of dry metallic, you know, um, if you're not catching that inside 15 or 20 seconds, you probably need some. And if you're one of those, I can squish it around for a minute and you're not tasting anything. Yeah. So you just hand them the bottle and start taking one every 10 minutes until you're done. Um, I, and, and here's the thing, and I'll go back to it. For those people that are like, well, I don't know if it's really that big a deal. It's like, okay, so let's, let's ignore the fact that um, through this crisis has brought to the forefront that even something as simple as zinc is essential to make sure that your immune system is able to fight viruses. Now, I mean, and there's a guy here in Austin that, I mean, I've, uh, and I've, I've, talked, to, I've talked to him for years. Um, his big th thing was zinc for everything, and he had these big 500 milligram chewable wafers um that you know you and man they'd knock out a cold like that it was great um chewing on one was like you know imploding your face because it was like it was incredibly drying um you know so I, it, this is nothing new i mean and trust me he's not a millionaire why because you don't make a lot of money off of zinc but we're finding out just how important it is so um but even those people that want to ignore that for viral loads even those people that want to eliminate it for um, you know, that are not really worried about, you know, about COVID. And uh, there's arguments about how worried you actually should be based on this. But I can guarantee, so the number of people, and I'll say, okay, the, let's talk about the number of people, you know, that have caught and caught and died from COVID. And the answer is, you know, most, for most people, none. Um, you know, I have a couple of COVID positive patients. I have family members that were COVID positive. They're asymptomatic, but, you know, um, but let's compare that for a moment for the number of people, okay, and show of hands out there, um, who's known somebody that has died of cancer? You know, just about everybody, right? If you're not worried about zinc with COVID, let's at least talk about zinc in relation to cancer because we know that imbalanced zinc and copper ratio, if you don't have enough zinc, it'll push you forward toward cancer, okay? You may not know COVID, but I can guarantee every one of us have known somebody that have died of cancer, okay? Um, the risk levels are huge, particularly the older you get, so... Okay, you may gamble on COVID, but I can guarantee everybody out there is at risk for cancer of some form, all of us. Um, so even if you're not doing that, zinc is a very simple way to try to get that, that immune system again balanced. So let's bring it back to your original question. So why push zinc? Because we know not only does it fight viruses, but it keeps the immune system balanced. Viral viruses are all about that lymphocyte-driven lymphocyte reaction to, a, to, to address uh, viruses. Great. But remember those cytotoxic, cytotoxic natural killer cells and things like that. All those, all those macrophages that affect abnormal cells. Well, that's part of your immune system too. Zinc helps activate and maturate those. Vitamin D helps maturate and acclimate those. And that very ability, that ability of the immune system to adapt to things means that you can handle the next COVID that may come along, but it also surveils abnormal cells in your own body. Because modern medicine, I've got to patient with triple negative breast cancer right now that we're that we're trying to fight down and part of what we're, we're we're talking about with our oncologist is the blossoming area of immunotherapy the idea of using your immune system to fight you know like it's a new thing your immune system to fight cancer what do you think the immune system does anyway it's been doing this for three billion years of evolution okay the immune system is there to get rid of those abnormal cells and if it's not adaptive enough to fight COVID it's not going to be adaptive enough to fight the endogenous cancers we will all eventually start developing so zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D, right. medicinal mushrooms. Love Notice it. the same medicinal mushrooms, not recreational. Okay. This is still Austin. This is still Austin, but we have people listening from all over. So, but um, I think we covered all for zinc. I mean, I love zinc. It's like my, my obviously. Main. Yeah. <laughs> well, you'd love zinc. It seems like, right? I do. No, I do. I do. And you know what? I like, I, and here, here, here's the part that explains why I'm in, why I'm in the size office that I am. I love anything that's cheap and effective. Okay. 
I don't think, you know, one of the problems I have with, let's go back to the triple negative breast cancer patient. I despise the idea that something that's cutting edge, something that's effective has to be horrifically expensive in the meantime, okay? We've, we've been handling things like this using natural approaches for thousands of years. You know, just because it's cheap doesn't mean it's not going to be effective. You know, God forbid, vitamin C, vitamin D. Vitamin D, as cheap as you can get. Go outside, take your shirt off, okay? You know, unless you're as white as I am, in which case, you know, up in flames. But, um, but you know, vitamin D, it's hard to get cheaper than that. Go out and soak up sunlight, you know? My lawn does it every day. Why shouldn't I, right? Um, cheap and effective do not, does not mean does not mean it doesn't work. It just means that it's something that doesn't make some other company a lot of money, you know, whether that's a pharmaceutical or God forbid a naturopathic company. Okay. Cheap does not mean bad. So, right. No, I agree. And let's, okay. We've talked about zinc for a lot. We're probably gonna have to just call this a zinc episode, but that's okay. But let's talk about vitamin D. We all know how important vitamin D is. And I had a, you know, a little Facebook post I did on levels of vitamin D and I meet with practitioners like you that are functional. And we know that the levels that are deemed, you know, deficient by the RDAs are super low. And if you're above well, 30 nanograms per milliliter, oh, you're good. But we know that that's not true, right? Well, now. Robert, Robert, you know what RDA stands for, right? Tell me. Rats, drugs, and assumptions, okay? We, <laughs> there's no data that backs that up. But like it's like the, the, level, the level, 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 the lowest levels they have for vitamin D are basically enough to keep you from getting rickets. Sure. But it's not enough to actually get you anywhere. Um, now, I, here's where I'm going to kind of break with, con, with, with some of my naturopathic brother on this. So a lot of us used to push for a vitamin and, and how much vitamin D do you need to take? My response is enough to get you to where you need to be. Um, for some people, if now understand, vitamin D gets chewed up in the body pretty readily. An inflamed intestinal mucosa, for example, will chew up between six and 8,000 IUs of vitamin D by itself. So if you've got irritable bowel, you've got reflux, you've got ulcerative colitis, you've got food allergies, okay? You got food allergies and you're eating the wrong stuff, let's be clear. clear. Um, you got some kind of inflammatory process in the bowel and you're taking 5,000 IUs a day, you're gonna be losing 1,000 to 3,000 a day anyway, just in the gut, much less what your body actually needs. So inflamed mucosa in the gut and the brain, anywhere else will chew up vitamin D by itself. Um, so, and then you've got all the hormonal signals. Are you, you know, do you have Genetic osteoporosis? Factors. You're trying to fight that. Sorry, what? Genetic factors like a VDR, yeah. THC. Yeah, v yeah, VDR TAC, VDR BSM, all those, yeah. you know, in which case you're gonna have to increase your levels. So I always go back to, fine, let's go back and do your blood levels to actually see where those are. I have a patient that was, you know, that came in, her vitamin D levels were at a six. That was this week. Um, and I'm like, and she, and her doctor's like, I don't understand. We have you on 5,000 I use of vitamin D a day. And I'm like, well, obviously it's not working. Um, so, you know, it's typically, and God forbid they put her on the RDA right now, you know, because I guarantee that thousand I use is going to do anything. Right. Um, in her case, we're going to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm putting her on, shall we say considerably more than that, at least short term. I'm going to go back and check her vitamin D levels in a couple of months. Okay. Um, now, for years, I used to be on that, you know, a little is good, like, so a lot must be better. So let's just take vitamin D and like, let's, let's do it until it starts leaking out your ears sort of guy. Um, I used to think, and this is based on some of the data for uh, osteoporosis, because there were some good studies out there showing that your vitamin D levels floating between 80 and 100 are really good for osteoporosis. As we're finding out now, that may not be quite as necessary. If you're forced, if you've got nothing else going on, you may need to push that pathway a little bit harder, but realistically, most people, when they're shooting for, for a therapeutic value, there was a study done in 2015 by the, in the British Medical Journal called the Inverse J Study, okay? Because that's what the graph looks like, is this Inverse J. Um, the Inverse J Study basically turned around and said that the lowest all-cause mortality rate was actually in people whose vitamin D levels were between about 35 and 48. So we really don't have to push it quite as aggressively to start getting um, good effects. Now, admittedly, the, the downside of that J is it kind of extends out. You've, you've actually got quite a range in there where you've got some therapeutic values. And again, if you've got, you brought it up, the genetic factors like BD, uh, VDR BSM or VDR TAC, which is the vitamin D receptor. Um, if you've got those, you're not internalizing it as much. So sometimes you have to tweak it a little bit harder to get effects because, again, the serum levels don't necessarily reflect what's going on in the cell. So those right. genetic factors in getting tested are very important. Um, by the way, just for those of you who you know are really kind of astute and kind of knit things together in your heads, 
Um, remember that the internalization, the VDR receptor, also affects how your brain produces these neurotransmitters called catecholamines. So if you have VDR mutations, you're more likely to have lower levels of dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. So norepinephrine, you know, cause, you know, helps with mental focus. So if you got a little brain fog, like I am without my coffee, um, or, you, you know, or if you got somebody with low dopamine values, well, what's low dopamine? Well, I really don't care. If you, what's the old joke? There's only two things in life you really enjoy and that's dopamine and serotonin and everything's a way to get there, right? right? You got that patient that just can't feel joy about anything. It's usually, you know, it may not be serotonin. That may be low dopamine. Okay, all of those are like little clinical indicators. I like testing. I'm a big fan of testing. Um, but if you've got an indicator that their catecholamines may be a little bit low, their fight or flight mechanism shot because they're not producing epinephrine, for example. So they got low catecholamines and their vitamin D levels are floating a little low. You may have to hit them harder with vitamin D than average. Um, and yeah, I'll get pretty aggressive. Like I said, I, I, um, my standard dosage for most people is usually starting out, starting them out about 10,000 I use a day, unless they're sun bunnies out there. Um, some people, we will go more aggressive than that. And like I said, there are studies out there for certain forms of cancer or uh, hyperparathyroidism, for example. There are studies in the literature using 100,000 IUs a day or more. Um, there was one study that was done a couple of years ago in a prison population um, where they were doing preventative treatments against the flu. And uh, this particular doctor, he was treating them wing by wing, and they know that the flu rolled through about every, you know, about every year about this time. So he started treating one wing um, and about the time he started treating the other wing, about just before it, the flu hit. So he had this kind of study automatically set up. So one wing got treated with about 100,000 IUs of vitamin D um, and the other wing got nothing. Well, flu ran, ran, ran rampant through that one wing and the other wing got nothing. So, um, but again, you don't want to reach vitamin D toxicity. It does happen, okay? Sure. Um, we're talking about temporary dosages. And with all things, always make sure you are backing up what you are doing with testing. Um, your ideal ranges, what do you dose them? Whatever it takes to get them into that minimum and ideal range between 35 and 48. Um, now, why do we want to do that particularly with the immune system? Again, because number one, it, vitamin D is the hormonal signal that reseals the gap between those enterocytes, that, that, uh, that leaky gut syndrome. If you don't have, have high levels of vitamin D, you've got a chronically leaky gut. You don't have that, uh, that intrinsic immune system that will be able to block stuff coming into your body. Um, vitamin D is the hormonal signal to be able to promote the maturation of all of your white blood cell types, your neutrophils, your lymphocytes, your, uh, your natural killer cells, your, your basophils, and so on and so forth. Um, without that hormonal signal, you've got a bunch of infant white blood cells kind of wandering around until it wa wanders into COVID and then it gets beaten up, right? We've got to have, you've got to have those signals. And vitamin D has, oh good Lord, I think vitamin, vitamin D has at least 60 or 70 documented uses in the body. It's hard to go wrong with it. I mean, magnesium's got you know, like 380, so it's got a while to catch up, but we're, you, can't, you, can't, you really can't go wrong with vitamin D. Right, okay. So this is a interesting question. If you had to pick one lab test that you could only use, only one marker, you can only test one thing on your patients, what would you choose and why? For everybody? For everybody. Would it be vitamin D? Would it be something oh, else? Suck. Oh, you suck, you suck. Um, and it has to be a lab marker. Yeah, just what it be, yeah, just tell me what you would think you would choose. See, that'd be hard. I, and I'm 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 a little I'm a little I'm a little biased here. Now, here's where here's where I'm gonna go completely off off the side of what you think I'm gonna do. Okay. So if it had to be in men, I'd say testosterone. If it had to be in women, I'd say progesterone. Okay. Reason is, if you look at testosterone health in men, it is most closely associated with how your immune system is, how your cardiovascular system is. It's like you can generally, if somebody that's inflamed, but I've never seen anybody heavily inflamed that's got a good good testosterone value, assuming you're not, uh, assuming you're not exogenously, you know, applying. Women progesterone is the same way, and progesterone is an anti-inflammatory by itself. You know, so you're, you're, you know, I, 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 you're, you're kind of going for maybe a CBC, which is easy because you can see what the relative levels look like, but just one, just one. Yeah. No, I would say, no, I would say, I would say depending upon men or women, I'd either go for progesterone or testosterone because right. those hormonal, those hormonal signals really are kind of the, the culmination of a lot of different factors. Um, I've never seen a really healthy guy that's got low testosterone. I've never seen a really healthy woman that's got low progesterone. Okay. Um, and usually those, and if you look at what those hormones do in the body, testosterone 
pushes forward metabolically men's immune systems, our cardiovascular systems. And women, progesterone does the same thing. Brain health, cardiovascular health, immune health, inflammatory response, all those relate into that. Now, I'm very biased because, like I said, my PhD is in nutritional endocrinology and my specialty was actually testosterone. So I will admit, I've got a very colored view on this. Sure. Um, but you said one. Now, ironically enough, if you're, if you're out there just kind of wandering around, the biggest thing I would say, and this goes back to my mentor, Dr. Jack Kessinger, okay? Jack used to say that one of the best things you can do on a physical exam, and, and I don't care, even if you're not doing blood tests, this is real easy to do, is grip strength, okay? There is a direct and well-established correlation between longevity and overall health and your grip strength, okay? That whole, you know, being from Texas, we're always kind of like, ah, we go and shake your hand and see whose fingers break first, right? it's not just a matter, a matter of bravado, that grip strength really does talk an awful lot about the cardiovascular health. Do you have enough perfusion to uh, the distal upper extremities? Do you have uh, the nervous innervation that goes onto the periphery? Do you have enough energy for those muscles to contract? Um, so on a physical exam standpoint, and again, this is kind of, you know, way out there. Nobody is going to say this, but I would say that, look, grip strength actually is a really good indicator. It's just kind of like you walk up and you shake somebody's hand. If they get a good solid grip, you know what? Typically, they're going to have a much better time of being able to adapt to things than people that have a very weak grip. It's not to say you should go around trying to arm wrestle everybody, but, you know, these are some kind of non-standard measurements. And bluntly, I've found a good correlation between what your overall inflammatory and uh, nutritional standpoint is going to be and what your grip strength is like. Now, you know, not everybody's going to go out and get a progesterone or a test testosterone test, but I can guarantee you have the opportunity to shake somebody's hand every day. Right. Love it. Yeah, I, re I read that study. It was Grip strength was a better predictor of, was it cardiovascular disease than yeah. the other marker? But yeah. So I, I was thinking you were going to say vitamin D because vitamin D, if you're deficient, you might not be producing as much cholesterol. We know the cholesterol is you know, responsible for the sterogenic pathway and mitochondria going to testosterone. Yeah. So yeah, I know, and I'm not, and I'm not, and I'm, I'm not arguing. Okay, um, vitamin D is a great strength. I know a lot of people that it's like they run a urinalysis on everybody. I'm like, okay, that I'm going to push. But um, metabolic panel, CBC, um, it depends upon again. It depends upon the practitioner and what they're looking for and what their what their keys are. Yeah, you come to me with a vitamin D level at, you know, that that lady who's got a vitamin D level at, at six. It's like okay, you've either got something massively inflammatory going on with your immune system or you got leaky gut or probably food allergies. You got the average person rolling around with a vitamin D level at a 12. Yeah, unless you're living under a rock, okay, you're probably eating something that's inflammatory to your body. But that's, again, from a, from a naturopathic standpoint, a functional medicine standpoint, yeah, it's real easy for us to kind of clue in and say, aha. Um, but, you know, again, that depends upon what I said back at the beginning. You focus on those things that your background brings to you. Robert, you got a great background in sports medicine, okay? Um, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're an athlete yourself. You're in really good shape. Your wife's really buff too, okay? You're raising little, like, Arnold Schwarzenegger kids. You're doing great, right? So you, are, you will reflect a lot of those markers based upon that background, okay? Um, you know, if you get somebody who is, you know, who's, who's, background is a traditional Chinese medicine, their first indicator may not be grip strength. It may be, hey, I'm looking at the scalloping or the white coat or the green pallor on your tongue. Or, you know, they may be looking at, you know, the various nail beds if you're one of those. Or if you're an iridologist, they're looking at flex in your eyes or something. Um, so, you know, what, what I would say would be the standard indicator for me, yeah, because my background is nutritional endocrinology. You know, that's a, you know, I'm going to look at those because for me and my mental web of things, that's where it ties into everything. Um, vitamin D may be the fundamental for some people. For some people, it may be, you know, some of those other indicators. And that's where I'm going to go back and say that, look, just because it's my primary indicator doesn't mean that it depends upon how that mental web in your head wires everything together. Where, where can you see those pieces put together? Um, now, that being said, you've also seen enough of what I run on terms of blood work to say that, yeah, I'll never run just one test because... Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it was a trick question, but um, but you're mean. Of, you're mean. <laughs> well, there, there's just a lot of people out there who who don't get any lab work done. Like they get their standard yeah. physical, which is going to test thyroid, CBC. That's it. No vitamin, no. right? So, no, and no, 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 no. And I'll ar and I'll argue. This is time for another webcast, but. I, I will argue that they get their thyroid checked and all they get look at is their TSH. And I will tell you, if you're using TSH alone as an indicator for thyroid health, you are being gypped. Okay. It is a horrible indicator for thyroid health. 
Now, according to the American Society of Endocrinologists, the American, you know, the endocrinologists are all about you don't have to test anything except TSH and maybe T4. But I will tell you, I don't think either of those is a good indicator of thyroid function. So right. I would I would turn around and say if you think you if you're getting your vitamin, and I will say this often if you are getting your vi your 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 your, test your your thyroid checked and your TSH is normal, and you feel like crap, guess what? You're right. <laughs> TSH can lie, and there's about seven different tests that need to be run to actually figure out what's going on with your thyroid. Now. And again, that'll tie back into the end of the, the subject today because your thyroid's your primary metabolic metabolic indicator. Okay. If you're hypothyroid, you are more prone. And this is in this is what they teach you in medical school. You're hypothyroid, you're more likely to get you know, to catch various forms of diseases. You're more likely to catch a cold, you're more likely to have um, cancer, you're more likely to have all of these various pathologies because your immune system's low, because the immune system requires energy. So yeah, I mean it's not just gonna be a single indicator. Um, Right. You uh, asked. We're, we're going to have to do another, yeah, probably no, another whole show on just thyroid. Okay. So we're backing up no here. We're going, we're going ahead really fast and I'm just going to back up. So talk about zinc, talk about vitamin D. And um, okay. I want to just, just for people listening, who might have no understanding for TH1, TH2. Can you, can you go over those, you know, the okay. differences and what they mean? So, and then balance so, right this. Okay, so think of, think of um, so TH1, so you got your T cells. Remember I said your lymphocytes have two different kinds. You have B cells and T cells, okay? We're going to ignore the B cells for the time being. Let's go back to the T cells. The T cells have a bunch of different sub subtypes. One of them are T helper cells. Um, think of T helper cells kind of like um, an advertising department or a, a line of cheerleaders, okay? T helper cells induce certain activities in your immune system and steer it down a variety of pathways. There are, I mean, and there, technically there's a bunch of different types of T helper cells. The big ones are Th1, Th2, and Th17. Th17 is dominated in inflammatory conditions. Th1 and Th2 basically steer the body down either the humoral re re related pathway, which is more antibody related, or more cellularly generated pathway, which is more, or, or Th2, which is more cellularly generated. Um, your body, because it only has a certain amount of T helper cells, usually keeps those undifferentiated. So let's take that. We got a we got a whole team of cheerleaders, right? And they're in the bat, they're in the they're in the in the dressing room, and they've got a whole stack of like red pom poms on one side and blue pom poms on the other, right? And depending upon which team is ahead, they'll tell them, okay, go root red or go root blue. Well, they'll go grab those pom poms and go out and wave them back and forth on the sidelines, okay? And when they're done, they'll come back and put them down and sit back down and wait to figure out how they got to root for next. Depending upon what goes on, they may be switching back and forth because there's only a limited number of, of cheerleaders. Well, your T helper cells are the same thing. You've got an undifferentiated batch, TH0, that is undifferentiated. They're kind of sitting there in the, sitting there in the walk, locker room, looking around, waiting for something to happen. And depending upon the inflammatory factors, the interleukins, the, cyto, uh, the cytokines in your system, that help induce those little signals that tell them to go for TH1 or TH2, okay? But if I've got an overload in one of those signals, it locks everything off. And essentially all you get is either TH1 or TH2 and nothing, nothing sets the pom-poms down, nothing differentiates them back to that undifferentiated state where it can become adaptive. And like I said, too far down one way, you start developing allergic responses, too far down the other way, you develop autoimmune. Um, TH2, allergies, TH1, autoimmune, is that right? <laughs> You're gonna catch me. I'm trying to remember. I think, I think, TH1 is allergies and TH2 is autoimmune. I think I have to go back and look at the diagram. We'll look it um, up. We'll, you, you caught you caught me. It's Friday afternoon, so I'm 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 about half a cup of coffee down. I'll go I'll go retool <laughs> and figure that out. Um, but you know, from our standpoint, you know, it, now here's the thing. So in terms of pharmacology, it makes a big difference because well, do I suppress one pathway or the other? And but from a functional medicine standpoint is the answer is no, you don't suppress anything. Just like I don't want to boost anything. Again, it goes back to that adaptability. And so the factors that cause the TH1 and TH2 differentiation, again, are largely those cytokines involved with inflammation. So step one, reduce your inflammatory load. And that could be, you know, a, a, a full full variety of turmeric, something that's, you know, works on downregulating regulating kappa B. Um, it can be fish oils, it can be resveratrol, you know, pick your favorite natural anti-inflammatory, uh, vitamin D. Um, once you start removing those factors, and you've got to start with removing the factors that are pushing it forward, whether that's 
downregulating it through anti-inflammatories or you're eating a better diet, you know, and that, that includes, God forbid, not only the food you're allergic to, but also, and I've got a patient of mine because this reminded me today, um, your nightshade family vegetables. So you got some people just the nightshades themselves, potatoes, tomatoes, eggplant, red peppers. Those can evolve, e evoke an inflammatory response that, that is independent of an actual allergy. Um, and we had one patient we've been battling back and forth, and I've been asking her, you off everything on your food allergy panel? Yeah. Well, it turns out she has been doing fairly regularly tomatoes. And I'm like, well, okay. not Because we went through and, and double checked this. So I'm like, do me a favor. Try off of uh, nightshades for, oh, excuse me. It wasn't, no, it was red peppers. She even had, had knocked off tomatoes. It was red peppers. Um, and I said, not good, but it's part of the nightshade family. Go ahead and knock those off. Knocks them off. A week later, she's feeling fine. Um, Again, because they have an inflammatory response. So as we get back to that pathway of, of your, your T helper cells, you reduce the inflammatory factors, diet, environmental exposures, whether that's heavy metals or toxins or whatever else. You reduce the cytokines by turmeric or NF-kappa B or whatever else. Yeah, I'm doing this like everybody's seeing the diagram in my head, right? Um, so you reduce those factors, and then you go back to, to actual signals to those T helper cells to de-differentiate. So you take TH17, TH1, TH2, and you tell them, okay, everybody put your pom-poms down, go back to the go back to the dressing room and wait until we boy, this is really a terrible metaphor. Wait until we get a signal to tell you where tell you where to go next. And again, there's a variety of factors that do that. Um, I use a lot of PRP spray, poly rich poly uh, proline rich polypeptides. Colostrum does it pretty well. Um, medicinal mushrooms, and there's a couple of those that do very well. There's some indicator for things like uh, lion's mane, I think, is one. Uh, but the big one, a, big one is Agaricus blazii, okay? Uh, okay, which is, you know, it's a pretty standard medicinal mushroom that's out there, and again, that's been used r used rapidly, widely, should I say, for autoimmune disease? Why? Because it de-differentiates these activated T cells back to an undifferentiated state. Is so, that rich in beta glucans? Yeah, yeah. Nice. Well, the med and and the, the thing I will say about the medicinal mushrooms, and again, you know, there's one of my favorite things in the natural medicine, there's not side effects, there's usually side benefits. Um, the side benefit of using, say, colostrum is the fact that it's got lactoferrins and immunoglobulins, and, you know, not only does it help the T cells, but also acts as an anti-inflammatory, it reseals the gut. Um, the advantage of using a lot of those medicinal mushrooms um, that are high in beta-glucans is not only does it does it cause those T cells to de-differentiate back to a state where they're not overacting one pa pathway or the other, but it also gives you, again, you see those beta-glucans and those beta-glucans, and it took us a while to kind of figure out the mechanism of action of it. It's still kind of under debate, but a lot of them act as kind of vaccines because what they're figuring out is the, the beta-glucans kind of act to prime a lot of the immune cells um, toward epitopes, that is little visual parts of them that look similar to vaccines and back, or excuse me, viruses and bacteria. So what you're doing is not a vaccine, but kind of a natural stimulus to kind of get the body thinking along those lines. So when you get exposed to those later on, it says, okay, wait a minute, the proteoglycan I see on this bacteria looks an awful lot like that beta-glucan I saw over here. Aha, now I've already got, you know, all I have to do is make this one little tweak and I can start attacking it. Um, that seems to be, as I tore apart the literature trying to figure out mechanism of action, that seems to be one of the current mechanisms of thought about how beta-glucans work. But again, we are now, we are using our science to try to explain something that, you know, in terms of human experience, we've been doing on our own for thousands of years. I mean, in, in Western medicine, mushrooms have been used um, in certainly in traditional Chinese medicine, in uh, uh, Japanese and Chinese uh, uh, Korean medicine, um, throughout Asia, a lot of the Asian medicines are st strongly use uh, medicinal mushrooms. Um, but you know, we we're only now we're discovering. Okay, oh, now we can we can loose we can describe the mechanism of action. That's great. It doesn't mean that they haven't been working. It means that our paltry understanding of their biochemistry is finally starting to back up what we've known from experiential uh, medicine for for thousands of years. Well, so I think it all goes back to eat a healthy lifestyle. Yeah, God forbid. Lots of fun. Decrease your stress levels. We know that increased stress depletes the nutrient highway, especially chronically, right? And we can talk about that all day long. Yeah. Um, and I think we're going to get a lot of hate if we don't talk about vitamin C. We, let's just go ahead and talk about vitamin C and immune function and anything else immune boosting. Okay. You're going to, you're going to, you, you, okay, be, okay. Be careful because you popped this cork. Okay. So I'm just, I'm telling you this can that's opening. Um, I am one of those people that actually believes that the, the, the hate that Linus Pauling got was wholly un undeserved. Um, 
Linus Pauling, for those of you, because every time you bring up vitamin C, eventually somebody in conventional medicine goes, yeah, well, vitamin C, that was, that was, that was Linus Pauling stuff, and he was a nut job. Yeah, he was a little wonky by the end, okay? But, you know, on the other hand, I will turn around and say, when you win, Nobel, win two Nobel Prizes, then you can turn around and start talking about him. Um, yeah, Linus Pauling talked about ludicrously high levels of vitamin C. Um, for therapeutic effects, you do have to take incredibly high levels for it to be effective as an intracellular antioxidant. That's how it works. Um, so when people say, oh, I took 500 milligrams of vitamin C today, I'm like, that's great. That's nothing, okay? Well, I took two grams a day. That's a, that's a step in the right direction. Well, where do you want me to start? Minimum of six. Um, Linus Pauling was taking 15 or 18 grams a day. And therapeutically, there's evidence in the, in the literature uh, about using up to 50 grams or more a day. Um, a lot of the reason now, to play devil's advocate, 50 grams of vitamin C is basically an entire orange tree. I mean, you know, you're just, I mean, that's a stupid level of vitamin C to be able to be produced. Arguments why we need so much. Number one, we live in a much more inflammatory society, okay? If you live out in the middle of nowhere and you're eating a, you're eating a good diet, your need for vitamin C is going to be a lot lower because your oxidative load is going to be a lot less than the guy who's driving an Uber up and down I-35 every day, sucking diesel fumes down and ch chowing down on Starbucks and McDonald's, okay? His oxidative load is going to be much higher. So to get to the point where vitamin C is going to be effective, it's going to take a lot less for that person with a clean environment versus the person that's living in the middle of an industrial center. Two has to do with a carbohydrate-rich diet, okay? And again, you asked, okay? So <laughs> just I'm warning you. So let's set back our way back wind machines for about 50,000 years, okay? Um, basically the time of the last ice age. Virtually every mammal, virtually every animal on the planet can produce its own vitamin C endogenously. Um, that vitamin C is converted uh, from its substrate by an enzyme called GULO. That I am not going to begin to try to pronounce because even me, me with my background, I have trouble with that one. Um, but the GLUO enzyme is active in virtually every other animal on the planet. Um, it's actually active in humans too, but only interestingly enough in utero. Somehow at birth, that enzyme gets inactivated because in us, in fruit bats, and in us fruit bats and um, guinea pigs, there we go, um, are three species that don't don't produce vitamin C. Um, now, guinea pigs and fruit bats have enough sense to eat enough fruits and vegetables to compensate for it, and then you have us, which, you know, we're probably the most self-destructive species on the planet. Um, now, the smart person asks, I say it generates from a substrate, what substrate is that? And that substrate is glucose. So in every other animal, they can take glucose and through a process of tautomerization, unravel the glucose and start gluing other things onto it and generate vitamin C. That last step is, is, is generated by that enzyme GLUO that somehow we shut off. So 50,000 years ago, we lost this gene um, or so. Um, there's a couple of arguments that that happened because during the last ice age, we need, it was more important to pile on the fat than it was to you know, express antioxidants. So we needed more cal calories. So we basically shut off that pathway so the body would accumulate more fat. Great. Um, but that's also why when you get sick, you got a case of the munchies. Why? Because the body says, hey, I've got a viral load. I got to, you know, I'm going to, I'm, you know, my, I'm going to start getting really hungry. I'm going to start munching on everything that's, and we all get the sugar fix. We all get the, I'd, I feel better if I had a candy bar. You know, it's like, why? We, we, we like things that are high carb, comfort foods, right? We like things that taste good and they're sweet. Why? Because they're high in calories. Because somewhere back there in the primordial reptilian brain, it goes, hey, we can take that sugar and we make vitamin C out of it to fight this infection without realizing we left that baggage 50,000 years in the past, right? So that's important for us and germane for us here because as we keep this drive toward having a more carbohydrate and sugar-rich diet, we saturate our, our body up. Now, you and I both know in the caveman style eating, if you look at fasting blood sugar, it's like 80, 85, right? Typically, that's where you're floating on a low-carb diet, which means you've got a low amount. But the average American now is floating 100 or so. I mean, we're 20 points higher. If structurally, vitamin C and glucose are very close, they have a shared, they have shared binding receptor affinity. That is because they have the same shape, they'll bind to the same receptors. 
So if I have a very high level of blood sugar above what I'm actually designed to have, because we're designed to be wandering through the garden, having a blood sugar, you know, 75, 80, somewhere in there. Instead, if I'm one of these guys that's floating around around 100, I have this curve where I now have exponentially more sugar than I should, that glucose is going to interfere with the binding of the vitamin C to its receptor. And that's why you need far more vitamin C than we should physiologically to kind of push through it on just a concentration basis to bind to that receptor to get inside the cell in the first place. This was called the, the ascorbate antagonism theory that was originally put, to get, put together by a believed George Ely. And he was, he was considered to be nuts at the time. Now, I'm going to divert and tell you the fun story. Okay. So I know, the guy, I know the guy that owns the Volvo involved with this, okay? <laughs> tell you the fun story to begin with. So way back when, okay, um, after his second Nobel Prize, Pauling flies into this, this town to give a lecture. He's jet lagged. He's fallen asleep, right? Ely wants to talk to him about this. So he knows the guy who's supposed to pick him up at the airport. He's like, can I come along? Yeah, okay, he sits in the back seat. So he sits in the back seat. He goes and picks up Pauling at the airport. Pauling goes in and sits in the, in, in the passenger seat. Pauling is falling asleep as, he's, as, asleep as he's driving, and Ely in the back seat is losing his mind, talking about, hey, there's this, antagoni this, this ascorbate antagonism theory that explains all those people that have been attacking you about why it's got to be so high. Pauling's falling asleep in the back seat. Ely's losing his mind in the back seat, and the guy driving is white knuckling it because he realizes if he wakes up, he's gonna he's got his third Nobel Prize in the bag, but he doesn't. He sleeps through it, <laughs> and he actually has a little plaque in the Volvo that says, "I was there." This is what happened, right? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Who would think that a fun story ever came out of a mid '80s Volvo, right? Anyway, so <laughs> that's the story. All of that to get to, so when people talk about vitamin C, yes, it absolutely works. The reason you have to take such stupid high volumes, and that's why it's important to take the right kind so it's not giving you, the, you, know, giving you diarrhea or anything, but the reason you have to take such high, high amounts is because your diet is higher in carbohydrates and sugars. As, as it is higher, it blocks off the body's ability to absorb that vitamin C, so you're going to need more in order to get inside the cell just to kind of push the blood sugar out of the way. So your answer to that is those low-carb diets, paleo, keto, that's why keto works as well as it does sometimes. Paleo, keto, intermittent fasting, anything that drops your insulin, anything that drops your blood sugar levels and starts normalizing it, allows vitamin C geometrically better chances of getting inside the cell. So, nice. you know, you need higher levels of vitamin C because we have more carbs in our diet. You knock off the carbs, you need less vitamin C. You still need the vitamin C. That is interesting. So, yeah, I just started, because everyone talks about, you know, vitamin C is water-soluble. If you take too much, you'll urinate it out. But the more you take, right, it gets more absorbed by the plasma. It gets more absorbed yep. by the cells. And so yep. if you take a gram, you're still saturating your cells at that level. You take another gram, you're going to saturate yourselves a little bit more. Yep. Even though you're going to urinate some of the byproducts, I think some people miss the boat. And that's why, like, intravenous vitamin C is a pretty – Hot topic right now. It's a buzzword. A lot of people are yeah. talking about it. You know, some other ones, but um, yeah. No, but even wow. even even IV vitamin C, you're bypassing the, the absorption from the gut into the bloodstream. You still got to get it into the cell. So even if you're doing even if you're doing the vitamin C and you're one of those people that's great, or if you're hopping on the boat boat of liposomal vitamin C, great. You still have to get it inside the cell. Okay, so I will argue for all those people that are just like, well, you know, it's, I want to get my vitamin C, but I don't want to take that much. Great. I don't, I have no problem. You can take less vitamin C. Let's cut out your carbs. Okay. Nice. Now all of a sudden they'll push back even further because it's like, but I don't want to give up my comfort food. Then you're going to stay sick. Okay. That's right. boil, boil it down to it. Okay. Because the food you are choosing, remember the, the, do, the, the, the difference between a, between a medicine and a poison is the dosage. And unfortunately the dosage for carbohydrates to be poison is really, really low. Okay. The more carbohydrates you eat, the sicker your body is going to be, the more vitamin, vitamin D and vitamin C you're going to chew up. I love that. Okay. So we went over zinc, vitamin D, vitamin C. Beta-glucans. We talked beta about glucans. Immunoglobulins a little bit. Is there any other immune-boosting vitamin or supplement you want to talk about before, <laughs> before we do our next show on thyroid health and whatever questions we get from this? Yes. And the answer is everything. Robert, I mean, you know, here, the, the point of functional medicine, everything is connected. Okay. Um, and that may be, for some people, that may be controlling their thyroid. We talked about thyroid, okay, um, in which case iodine may be important for them. Um, if somebody's got 
adrenal fatigue and their adrenals are just shot. Okay. You may need to control what their cortisol is doing because it's immunosuppressing. Um, if that person's got low testosterone and more my bailiwick, then you need to boost the testosterone if they're a guy, if they're a guy, if it's a lady, maybe probably not so much. Um, progesterone in women. Okay. It's, um, so is there anything else we want to talk about? Yeah, the whole of the rest of the body, because you can't boil immune health down to just these five or six things. Right. You have to take the core that's pretty much established for everybody. And then on top of that, personalize the medicine for what the person needs. What's, what's individually inhibiting your ability to maintain your immune status? Is that a genetic abnormality? We talked about the BDR TAC and BDR BSM. Is that um, MTHFR, something like this? Is it a genetic problem? Is it a thyroid issue? Is it a hormone issue? Is it an autoimmune problem? Is it a food allergy? We talked about those. That's where you have to start tearing apart and asking the hard question. What is it, what is it about my lifestyle right now that's a major impediment to my overall health? Because everything is connected to everything else. If you were ignoring a major, those people that say, well, you know, my diabetes really isn't associated with my cardiovascular disease. Yes, it is. Absolutely. But my thyroid really doesn't affect my irritable bowel. Oh, yeah, it does. Well, you know, I'm postmenopausal, so my hormones really don't affect my brain. You want to bet? Okay. Everything is connected. So, you know, my, my response to you is, is there anything else you want to talk about? Yeah. Anything else that's inhibiting that patient? And that's where you have to start looking at the individual. Awesome. Well, so many pearls in this quick, you know, hour segment today. And um, I'm excited to do it again with you. If you could let people know where they can find you online, where okay. they can find your practice, et cetera. Uh, we do have, uh, so you can go on Facebook and follow us at Lakeline Wellness Center. Uh, Lakeline Wellness, I believe is our tag. Uh, we do have a YouTube channel. Good luck finding it. Um, <laughs> or you can just go to our website, which is lakelinewellnesscenter.com, um, and you should be able to find us there. Um, or feel free to give me a call at our office. Um, we are, you know, always happy to hear from you. Number here is 512-337-3625. Awesome. And do you see patients from all over the world now through telehealth? I do. I do. The one thing, um, and I've been doing this for a while, but it's interesting that um, what, I, what I have been doing for a while is now becoming the industry standard um, where everybody's realizing that, you know, actually talking to patients is a pretty good idea. Um, I do see them by Skype. We do well, or Google Meet at this point. We do them by phone. There are various forms of telehealth, uh, depending upon what your, your access to technology is. I have patients literally coast to coast in the United States and lots of them outside the United States as well. I have several in uh, Saudi Arabia and some in India and I've got a smattering across various bases and things in Europe. So um, no matter where you are, the great advantage of the interwebs is that you, you have access to being helped. So if you got a problem, feel free to give me a call or I'd be glad to, glad to talk to anybody. And if you want to find somebody local, like I said, I'm always happy to try to find somebody who can actually put hands on you if that's what it boils down to, because it's all about trying to see what's best for your health. I love it. I love it. And if you had to make a billboard to put you on the spot again, then you could have one thing that you tell everybody about health or wellness in a couple sentences, what would it be? <laughs> Hashtag test on guess, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> no, no. It's like, is that everybody, everybody's health is personalized that if you measure yourself by somebody else's yardstick, you will always end up coming up short. So realize that with everybody's individual makeup, you shouldn't be treated in a cookie cutter fashion. And how you best address your own health is by testing and making an educated and scientifically rational plan based on that, based on your needs and based on what your tests say. Not what everybody else is doing, not what your sister's doing, your brother's doing or anybody else, but you need to find a plan that works for you based on good scientific knowledge. Love it. Everyone, thanks for joining in to episode four of Christian Health Solutions with Dr. Victor Carsed. We're gonna be doing stuff like this every single week. We're gonna definitely have Dr. Victor back on very soon. I know we're gonna have a ton of questions because he was dropping pearls today, guys. So if anyone needs to listen to this, listen to it again. And let's pick Dr. Victor's brain. He's one of the smartest intellectuals I know. So anytime you guys have a question, let me know and I'll re relate to him and then we'll get an hour long response. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Thanks guys, have a great day. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks Robert, bye guys.